I've been stewing about global warming and the greenhouse effect since I first heard the words in 1988. Until that day in June, I'd had no idea that burning carbon fuels like coal and oil and gas were altering the atmosphere and the oceans and making the planet hotter. Our consumer lifestyles that are the envy of the world were, it turns out, endangering the ecosystem that we depend on to live. This was global warming that I was hearing about, but it gave me chills. Over the next 20 years, I read everything that I could find about climate change, and the news just got more and more alarming. Hotter temperatures were melting the ice caps in the glaciers, raising sea levels. Weather events were becoming more extreme, with bigger and more deadly hurricanes, tornadoes, and floods. Heat waves, drought, wildfire was all increasing in frequency and lasting longer. But here's what really got my attention. Hit me right in the stomach, as it were. There would be food shortages. And it wasn't just the world's climate scientists that were raising the alarm. The Department of Defense designated climate change a national security threat that would foster food scarcity. Even Republicans like former Nebraska Congressman Doug B. Ryder are now warning that our food supply is at risk. To this point, the perils of climate change had simply unnerved me. Now, though, it was getting personal. We were talking about missing meals. <laughs> But I lived in the city. I didn't know the first thing about my food supply. I'd never done anything, really, besides go to the store. I was at a loss for what I, a city dweller, could do. So I did what everyone does, who's feeling confused and scared and doesn't know where to turn. I got on the internet. <laughs> And I learned that the average bite of food on my plate travels 1,000 miles to get there. I learned that 70% of the lettuce Americans consume comes from the California Central Valley, which is currently mired in a 500-year drought. I learned that 90% of the money that Nebraskans annually spend on food leaves the state. We're not buying food. That's from here. And I learned that the largest irrigated crop in the United States is the lawn. We grow enough lawn to cover the entire state of Ohio. My head was spinning. But I kept looking and came across an out-of-print gardening guide entitled The Complete Book of Edible Landscaping. And in the introduction of this book, the author posed a question that was to forever change my life as a city dweller. Why do we always plant things that we can't eat? <laughs> For the first time in the 22 years that I'd lived on my corner lot, I took a hard look at my yard. I had a crab apple tree, but not an apple. I had a mock orange, but not an orange. I had a yew hedge that not only wasn't edible, it was poisonous. In my entire yard, apart from this tiny tomato patch, there wasn't a single edible plant. It was all turf and ornamentals. I was appalled at myself. I began tearing up my lawn with a vengeance, <laughs> determined to grow food in every inch of my property. In my fervor, I even dreamt about becoming self-sufficient on what I now called 
my urban homestead just 12 blocks from Lincoln's downtown. <laughs> one growing season with one modest harvest, however, showed me that I really didn't have a clue about how a meal gets on my plate. The moment of truth, though, came courtesy of my career military neighbor across the street. For years, this neighbor and I had been waging yard sign wars. <laughs> Whatever yard sign one of us had, the other had the opposite. The most the two of us had ever done was occasionally wave at one another. One Sunday afternoon, though, as I was installing rain barrels, he came charging across the street. Tim, what are you doing? I didn't know what amazed me more, that he'd come over to talk with me or that he knew my name. <laughs> because I didn't know his. <laughs> but, but I explained that I was trying to collect my rainwater for use in my edible landscape. He good-naturedly complimented me on my garden and added that for his part, he did all his hunting and fishing at the grocery store. <laughs> I nodded, I nodded, and, and I realized at that point that, that we were finally starting to dialogue with one another. It was kind of a primordial form, but we were doing it, all right? But then he leaned forward and he said, but tell you what, when disaster strikes, I'll know where to come for dinner. <laughs> Here I was, questioning I could really, whether I could really feed my own family on one edibly landscaped lot, and now the neighbors were inviting themselves over for meals. <laughs> then and there, I knew I needed to be thinking bigger, bigger than what one household can do. My family, had been renovating a problem house in the block. But now we set to work converting that yard to an edible landscape. Some friends of ours, Linda and Ed, purchased the adjoining property and turning the backyard of that lot into garden space as well. We began issuing invitations to our neighbors to start growing food. The first year we had maybe eight families participate. For at least half of them, it was the first time they'd ever gardened and it kind of looked like it. <laughs> More weeds than food. But a seed had been planted, and we had high hopes of involving even more of our neighbors the second year. The following March, though, I was out digging up my garden beds, spading them, when two of our original gardeners, Heather and her son Eli, walked over and gravely announced that they wanted to tell me their plans. I feared the worst that they were moving. No, she said, but we're not going to garden with you in the neighborhood plot this year. We've talked about it, and we've decided that we're going to tear up the grass and garden in our own front yard. <laughs> yes! <laughs> and here's what their front yard looks like today, plus their new chicken coop. From that point forward, things just mushroomed. A neighbor I'd never spoken to before in my entire life wandered over one day and explained that her health didn't permit her to garden, but that we were welcome to use her backyard. And here's the bean patch that we planted in Lois's property, plus some cucumbers she liked. And then Stanley, an Asian restaurant owner and landlord that we'd been sharing our strawberries and pears and tomatoes with, one day, up and gave us a patch of his rental property to garden in. He was so tickled with the six organic tomato plants that we put in for him that the following year, he turned around and gave us the entire yard, 5,000 square feet. Take the whole thing, he said. No more mowing. <laughs> in six years, we've gone from that tiny 10 foot by 15 foot tomato patch in a block to six tenths of an acre, the equivalent of 65 yards of a football field, with over 50 fruit and nut trees, six grape arbors, six large strawberry patches, a dozen blackberry and raspberry brambles, two chicken coops, 
and two beehives. <laughs> 20 neighbors from in the block and across the street are now actively participating in what we call the Hamlet. And we've gotten so pumped about what gardening has done for our neighborhood that we're now growing lettuce greens throughout the winter. For 22 years, my wife Kay and I had lived in this block and knew the names of exactly three of our neighbors. Today, we know everybody. <laughs> and we've got the best unofficial neighborhood watch in all of Lincoln. <laughs> Oh, and my career military neighbor, his name is John. <laughs> nice guy, we just don't talk politics. <laughs> We're growing more than food in our hamlet. We're growing community. We're getting to know the people we live next door to while we put some homegrown food on our tables. And with the onset of climate change, and the threat of food shortages, this is exactly what our neighborhoods need to be doing. The city can't just be a consumer any longer. We can't just be eaters, expecting some faceless anonymous source to magically supply our food. We've got to start pulling our own weight in the food system and begin growing what we can. We'll never be self-sufficient. There's no room in town for fields of corn and wheat, and we can't keep the animals we need for dairy and meat. But what we can do in the city, we can do better than anyone else. We can grow the perishable items, particularly the lettuce greens, that are the hardest to keep on the grocery store shelf. And because they're grown and harvested right here where we live, they'll be fresher and more nutritious. Plus the carbon footprint, Producing and transporting such hard-to-keep food items will be dramatically less. Not one thing we're doing in the Holly Hamlet is original. Everything we're doing, we borrowed from somebody else. And if you've heard anything today that you'd like to borrow, <laughs> it's yours. We'd love for this neighborhood gardening idea to ripple all across Nebraska yard by yard, block by block, community by community. It's what we as city dwellers can do to help ensure that we know where our next meal is coming from. Thank you.